Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Petropolis podcast. I am with Dr. Rachel Geller during Cat University again. I'm so excited to have you back. We're talking about scaredy cats today. What's a scaredy cat? Dr. Geller, welcome back. How are you? I'm so happy to be here. I'm well, thank you. And I'm ready to talk all about scaredy cats. So if you'd like, I can just jump right in. Jump in. What's a scaredy cat? What, okay. is that, how do, what does that look like? So a scaredy cat for most new adopters is that cat who you bring the cat home and maybe she's hiding under the bed or you go to vacuum and the cat is terrified of the noise and runs away or your doorbell rings and none of your friends even believe you've adopted the cat because they never see the cat. So those, those are some examples of what I would call um, a scaredy cat. Um, but thankfully, there are some techniques that anybody, a new adopter, or, you know, there are a lot of people who have had shy cats or cats who are a little more reticent than other cats, and they've kind of lived with that for a while. You know, they figure that's okay, and it is. It's fine um, to have a shy cat, but if you want to try to get your cat used to sounds or to noises or to people, there are ways we can do that. Is that essentially same as dogs, desensitizing? Exactly. So it's, it is exactly that. It's a process, um, what I call systematic desensitization. And basically, you present whatever is causing fear to the cat in such small little increments. And so gradually, that over time, the cat gets used to um, the fear-causing stimulus and as a cat learns that this noise or this person or the sound doesn't have any meaningful consequences, doesn't cause her any harm, she becomes desensitized. In other words, she becomes used to it. And so that is the process that we use for anything that is causing the cat fear or stress. And you know, if you're if there is something in your house that's a more of a constant noise is a good idea to try to desensitize your cat so she's not living in a state of continual stress and anxiety. Interesting. I had a um, person ask me, how do they get their cat to use the litter box again? They had the vet check the cat. Everything was fine. The cat had stopped using the litter box, which was next to their toilet. And the toilet it was running all of a sudden it started started running on its own one day while the cat was in there so it was about figuring out what triggered the cat so we had multiple conversations over a month with this person coming into my store and we just talk about what triggered the cat he had to literally move the litter box out of the bathroom and put it in his bedroom which was killing him and well, you, you know, know it's, <laughs> that's yeah it's thing. interesting because um bathrooms, laundry rooms, basements are common places that people like to place litter boxes because it's kind of out of the way. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those laundry noises and pipe noises and water noises can be very scary and unsettling to a cat. And if the cat is in the box, when the water goes through the pipes or the toilet is flushed or the washing machine gets turned on and that cat becomes afraid, she will never go in that box again. You will have a little bit of a problem. So I do, if I'm brought in before the person decides where to place the litter box, I will always um, recommend strongly not to put the litter box in a laundry room or a bathroom because those water noises can be pretty scary to a cat, especially because we know when they're coming and we know what they are, but the cat has no idea. Right, right. Especially if it's a new kitty, if it's a new adoption, or if it's a new um, kitty in the household. So they're not used to those sounds in the background, or just passing by the bathroom door and you know, the water starts kind of running. So they're not accustomed to it. So when something new and the animal's new and they're already scared, imagine the panic. And who wants to be startled when they're sitting on the toilet? That'll... I that's <laughs> <laughs> I can, I mean, I agree. If I was on the toilet and I heard this big scary noise, I would be startled as well. But, you yeah, know, fortunately, <laughs> somebody or I could figure out what it was. But if you don't have that capability, you know, cats really 
make their decisions about places and especially litter boxes and their scratching posts based on comfort level and familiarity and feeling good about that location. So if you create this negative association with the location and the item, it can, it can seemingly cause a behavior problem. I mean, many people will look at it as the cat's having a behavior problem, but in the cat's mind, it's perfectly normal behavior and it's, and it's very logical. Something about this litter box is making this big sound I don't like it. I'm not going to go there. So in yeah. a cat's mind, it's all pretty logical. Yeah. Yeah. Nina, we have to start thinking like cats when we have yes. cats. Yes. But for, for those of us, again, we've talked about this living in small New York City apartments or Boston apartments. Um, it's hard to find the right space. And the bathrooms are often the best place for the litter box for those of us who live in small spaces. So, um, Let's talk about what we can do to help these cats not be fearful and continue to use their litter boxes. And let's, yeah, let's talk yeah. about scaredy cat. It's all yeah. yours. Sorry. So, yeah. So no, no, this, this is a good question because you're right. You know, if you live in a, a one bedroom, a studio apartment, um, the bathroom could be a good place. So what I would say to people and what I do find is a place, the litter box, a kind of wedge it behind the toilet or behind the sink. So see if you can put it someplace where it's not really under the pipes or in a place where they're gonna directly not only hear the noise, but feel the noise. So if you think about it and people are wedging the litter box under the sink or behind the toilet, you not only you know have the noise of the water, but you probably have like some vibrations and other right. sounds that the cat would pick up on. So try to put the box in a place that's not right up against the scary thing, be it the pipes or the toilet. Um, so it'll be less of a, the cat will be less reactive because it, it'll be a lot less daunting when it does happen or if it does happen. Absolutely, yes. And, you know, um, pheromone and calming products always help. Okay. So if you do have a scaredy cat and she's developed a fear of going into that bathroom where the litter box is, a plug-in, pheromone spray like comfort zone or feel mm -hmm. away or any brand you know as long as it says that it's a synthetic version of the cat's uh, pheromones is fine to use and um, that can help too but yeah. you know even little things you know make sure you're not may, maybe check the bathroom before you run the sink or before you check the laundry too just to make sure your cat's not in the middle of doing Absolutely. her thing in the litter box and that can help. Especially too. if you have covered litter boxes, you don't always see them in there, but you just kind of storm in and pop the toilet lid up and, and the cat's like, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, if you had definitely take the cover off the box because that will really help. So if a cat has a visual field and there's some type of trigger causing anxiety, but the cat can see around her, and see that there is no invader or opponent or predator, that can solve the problem right there. So take That's the covers crazy. off the boxes, that will really help your cat. I mean, we, we as humans think in terms of privacy, but a they cat, don't they don't care. What they care about is clear, clean sight lines all around them. So if something does, they do hear something scary, or they do feel something scary, the cat can look. Oh, I don't see an invader here. I don't see a predator. Oh, okay, I'm safe. So mm -hmm. taking the cover off can make a big difference. Yeah, yeah. And keeping the litter box clean too. That that reduces fear of going into a dirty litter box. That's that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> Sorry, I hate dirty litter boxes. <laughs> no. But, you know, especially it is true, you know, you bring in a new cat and there's these new noises. And I, I do find what I hear the most is, you know, the vacuum cleaner mm -hmm. and the doorbell. So um, for the vacuum cleaner, what I tell people is, so you don't want to just turn it on and vacuum your whole house if your cat is afraid of it. So present the vacuum to the cat in very small sessions. Um, you might even want to start out with just having the vacuum cleaner in the room. Let the cat have the opportunity to come up and investigate the vacuum, 
sniff the vacuum, walk around the vacuum, and she's going to see that the vacuum is not going to attack her. The vacuum is a benign object. And when she feels comfortable with that piece, you can literally just start running it two minutes at a time, five minutes at a time, work your way up. So you, you never want to go from zero to 60 when it comes to cats. So if the cat is super scared of the vacuum, literally turn it on and turn it off and, and spend a few days doing just that. When she stops running away, then you can add more time to the process. So you want to sort of gradually build up so your cat gets used to the idea of the vacuum running and nothing's going to happen to her when that vacuum is running. And, it, and little things too, you know, make sure you're doing a different room than the cat is in, things like that. And what if uh, like um, if you have a credenza or something that's high up, put the cat on top of there and let them watch you. So they can just feel confident that they're way away and you can't reach them and uh, they can watch what you're doing. I, yes. I did that with one yeah. of my cats when, when I first adopted her, everything startled her. So I put her on top of my credenza and she just sat there and hung her paw down and watched me vacuum. And, you know, I would stop vacuuming and go over and rub her nose and give her a treat and then go back to vacuuming. So the food, the treat was really what, I, what brought her she wanted to be closer to me because I had the treats. So she jumped on the bed the next time around. And I said, okay, now that you're on the bed, I can give you the treats on the bed and you're going to get more of them. So we did this <laughs> and she's such a, she's such a manipulative little thing. You know, now she follows me around and she tries to sit on the vacuum. So it's, it's become a complete different world. Well, that, yeah. <laughs> so it's amazing. And, and, yeah. And food is a very positive reinforcement for cats. Um, so food can definitely be used as motivation. Interactive play or interactive activity toys can be used as motivation. If you have a cat who loves to play, go Before ahead and do- or after, how do we do what- when Or do we you can start that? off just next to the vacuum when it's on the floor. So if you have a cat who's very playful and for that cat, um, play is an extremely positive thing in his life, conduct play sessions next to the vacuum. And you can even let the vacuum run a little bit, conduct a quick play session and follow that by a treat. So there's a lot of ways we can sort of desensitize our cats to these scary things. And to your point about vertical space, cats feel very safe when they're up high. So having um, a cat tree or a cat perch is a great place for your cat to go and feel safe. Um, if you live in a small New York apartment or Boston apartment, you don't need to spend a lot of money. I always say, look around your home. Chances are there is some shelving that's going unused. Uh -huh. That could be repurposed as vertical space, the back of a sofa, the top of a bureau. There's all kinds of things that are probably already existing in your home that you, know, you throw a cozy towel over it or something soft and comfy and suddenly now it's vertical space. So that works. And then some cats like the cat tunnels some cats like the cat cubes. Again, you don't have to spend a lot of money. A cat can feel safe inside a box lined mm -hmm. with a soft towel. So we have yeah. lots of ways to kind of put things out in the cat's environment where she can go and hide and feel safe while we're, you know, getting them used to these noises. Or, you know, even after we've gotten them used to the noises, they still might want to have their safe spot and that's okay. And we should provide them their safe spots. What about when, let's say, you have a guest and their kids come over and kids can be, you know, loud and crazy and playful and they want to scream and have fun. So you know, having a, the sudden going from a, a household where it's generally calm and relaxed, cat friendly to a household where you have guests or an emergency happens, especially these days, or there's an emergency and you have to have family stay over and there's kids or there's a lot of commotion or emotion. How do you handle those situations for cats that get agitated, that are agitated, that are not accustomed to having a lot of other people around or accustomed to having a very calm environment and then suddenly their whole world is shifted because of whatever human emergencies have occurred or new guests have, that have shown up? Yeah, that's, yeah. So if you're someone who doesn't have kids, so the cat's not exposed to any kids, and if 
if the issue is that you're having company every once in a while and they're bringing their children and the children aren't super great around a cat, I would just suggest keeping the cat in a separate room. Yeah. So for those short-term times where you have some friends and they're, they're not over all the time, you know, they come over once in a while, the easiest and safest and best thing for your cat is just to leave the cat in another room. Mm -hmm. She'll be happier, she'll feel safer, and you don't have to worry. So that's, that's all, that's the best way to go. If you have some type of an emergency and you're bringing family into your home and, or you need to go somewhere, so that's a different situation. Um, if there's room in the house, again, it would be best no matter what to keep the cat separate. You might have to use even a large crate and you could put a towel over that crate and that would allow the cat some, a, some sort of refuge, but it's okay even while you're providing the safe space concurrently to help the other people who are either coming into your household or you're going there to teach them how to act around the cat, how to move slowly, how to move gradually, how to use food, how to play. So we can keep our cat safe. And if this is going to be a more long-term arrangement, I would suggest at the same time, we teach these guests, you know, what the cat likes, what the cat's preferences are, how to approach a cat and how not to scare the cat. And again, that's all the type of same desensitization, you know, approaching slowly, approaching gradually, using food. Um, don't just barge in and be with the cat all the time. Let the cat have a safe space. So all that kind of stuff, because obviously if, you, if you're a single person or you're in a relationship and there's just two people and a cat or two people and two cats and suddenly there's a family uh -huh. there, um, you know, that is very, very stressful to a cat and you know what it's stressful for the humans too i mean yeah. if there's some type of emergency then you're bringing in people no probably not a lot of people are happy right now so try to keep the cat separate as much as you can and if it's going to be more of a long-term or permanent situation be you know conduct sessions and work with the people during during the times they're around to get the cat used to the people and the people used to good cat handling at the same time and in those situations, it's come up, it's happening more and more lately um, with loss of jobs and people having to move in with their parents or their families and take their pets with them. So um, how do we get everyone on the same? We have, let's say we have the conversation, but what about getting the cat's food in a space where they're comfortable and their litter box in a space where they're not agitated, what are the best things to do? Just have a focus on the cat's reaction, just sit back and focus on it and put yourself in the cat's shoes. What do we do at that point? Right, well, absolutely think about it from the cat's perspective. I mean, from the cat's perspective, if you, if you own a cat and you've lost your job or had some type of financial hardship and you're moving in with your parents to your cat, your, her entire territory is changing. Her entire environment is changing. And these are people she doesn't know. She doesn't realize that these are your parents. So you're gonna have to treat this as any other opportunity to present the cat with something that's completely new and scary, which is going to have to be the same thing gradual introductions, um, start off and maybe having your parents just sit in the same room with the cat, but not necessarily make any overtures towards the cat. Let your parents have some opportunities to feed the cat. That way um, their smell is on the food and that's a good way to make positive associations. If you can be with your parents and play together with a fishing pole type toy, that would be fantastic. So the cat is, enjoying a game, the cat is feeling good, the cat's getting captures, and then the parents are part of the game. So, um, you know, I think the, wor the words to always remember are go at the cat's pace. So let the cat set the pace of the interactions. Cats are really amazing communicators and that cat's going to let you know how she feels about meeting your parents. So 
she might be a braver explorer and venture right out, or she might be, you know, in the corner of the room as far away as possible. Use her, what she's telling you as a guide and take it from there. Um, just think if you were plopped into a place that you didn't know, you know, you'd be a little wary and um, careful at first too. And, and for a cat, since we can't explain it, there's a connection between you and these two people, they're gonna act like you would if you were plopped into a complete stranger's home. Got it, got it, wonderful, wonderful. What else do scaredy cats do? What should, be, well, what should we, uh, as what should new pet owners be aware of when they first bring a cat home? Are there signs that'll show that this cat's going to go hide or that we're doing something wrong? It's like body positioning, ear positioning, tail positioning. Is there something that we need to know to look out for? Well, I think the most important thing is when you do bring home your new cat, start the cat off in a small room. And I know, I know a lot of people say, oh, it's cruel to start, you know, to put my cat in a little room. So again, we're thinking like a person. I may not like to be locked in a little room all day long, and you may not like it, but your cat would actually prefer it. He already has enough to figure out, enough to learn, enough to investigate. There's going to be plenty for that cat to do in a little room. So start the cat off in a small room. Now, if you walk in, and the cat isn't coming up to greet you, the cat is still afraid, the cat's ears are rolled back and down, which signify fear. Um, maybe the cat's tail is a little puffy because he thinks he might have to get into a, a battle to claim his territory. Um, maybe if you look at his body, he's very tense. So this is a cat who hasn't yet bonded to you. So you definitely don't wanna start introducing this cat you know, to your friends and to <laughs> Uncle Harry and to Aunt Molly and, and whatever. So again, follow the cat's lead. Let the cat be really comfortable with you first before you start introducing him to all kinds of things in your own home, people or territory or objects. So if the cat's afraid in that one little room, you're not gonna introduce him then to your whole house because then it's gonna be completely overwhelmed. If your cat's afraid of a, a noise that he hears in the little room, you're not gonna have him come out to the whole house where he hears all the household noises. So let him get used to the rhythms of the household, the noises of the household within that small room first. And when the cat's coming out to greet you, or better yet, if the cat's even trying on his own to get out from the room, then that's a good sign that he's ready to explore the rest of the house. So follow the cat's lead, go at the cat's pace, let the cat be the guide. If you follow those little rules, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll be okay. If the cat is jumping every time the doorbell rings, you know, what you can do again is, is desensitize the cat to that sound. It's okay to ring the doorbell and then be there and give him all kinds of love and attention and a treat. Mm -hmm. So he learns that the doorbell is not gonna be anything scary. Because there's always, we can always use food. We can always use attention. We can always use play. And we can use our voices in a soothing tone. The cat will understand that. So there's lots of stuff that we can do to create new, positive, reassuring associations with a scaredy cat. Can I tell you a doorbell story? <laughs> yes, I'd love, I'd love to hear a doorbell story. So I had a client whose new cat was fearful of the doorbell. So I told her to record it on her phone. And when the cat is sleeping next, because the cat loved to be in her arms and sleeping with her. So she would just click on the recording if when the cat was out cold in her arms and she was already holding the kitty. So she would just hug her a little bit tighter. She would <laughs> play the recording a couple of times. The cat was desensitized after about five, six days because the cat would be eating and mom would be in the kitchen rubbing her head as she was eating. And then she would hit the play button on her phone <laughs> and it would come up and she would keep rubbing her and give her big kisses. And the cat was like, all right, it's not that bad. I'm eating, things aren't that bad. So it happened so fast, we, she was shocked. She was jumping up and down and she sent me some really bad videos. But um, 
we were thrilled because this cat went from jumping three feet high every time the doorbell rang to, yeah, this is no big deal. And it just started with a recording and her clicking on it whenever the cat was super relaxed and close enough where mom could, you know, manage the process and give her security. So after a while, she didn't even need her mom to be, you know, the kitty didn't even need the owner to be the security blanket. So it right. was just a great yeah. story. Yeah, and that's what happens with desensitization. You know, the cat realizes and learned that nothing actually is going to happen. The sound has no consequences. The sound doesn't cause her any harm, but we need to just always present it very gradually mm -hmm. and very slowly. So like, think about something that you don't like or that you're afraid of. A lot of times I use spiders as an example, because a lot of people don't love spiders. So <laughs> if I said to you, I'm terrified of spiders and your solution was to like, dump me into a vat that was completely full of spiders from my toes to my head, that probably wouldn't help my fear too much. It would no. most likely make it a lot worse. But if you said, well, here's one spider on my hand and stood like maybe three feet away and let me look at it, I could look at it and say, hmm, okay, nothing's happening. That's okay. So you always want to make sure that you present things slowly and very gradually. You don't want to do what's called flooding. You don't want to present too much all at once. It'll be overwhelming and it could backfire. It could make the fear worse. So you always want to be aware of um, going so slowly that you can't overwhelm the cat. Okay. What about, this is a big thing, getting that cat carrier out <laughs> and they go into hiding and then you have to go find them. Let's talk about the carrier and what to do. And I know you're going to go into desensitization. So floor is all yours, Dr. Geller. <laughs> well, what I like to do with the carrier is I like to have it out in the house, in the room where you hang out the most. So the cat starts to look at it as just another cozy piece of furniture and not a traveling prison cell to the vet. So, <laughs> so the idea is um, put the carrier in a room. I tell people to either take off the doors or use um, pipe cleaners to prop the doors open. Because if the cat does venture in, I don't want to take the chance that the door is going to slam on the cat and scare her because that will sort of defeat the purpose. Well, we, have, so, we also have those, those soft carriers where you can just have the top open and the, and the front open so they can yes. go, through yep. the, go through the front and out the top so they have escape routes all over the yep. place. Yep. So, you know, if it's a hard carrier with that firm door, do something so the door won't close. Soft carriers, you won't have to worry about that noise. And yes, so have it in the room and eventually the cat's going to come and investigate it. You can put a soft towel in there, um, something cozy, something fleecy. I even throw treats into the carrier mm -hmm. um, and let the cat get used to just seeing the carrier as just one more potential nap place in the room. Um, after a few weeks, the carrier's on the floor and the cat's kind of maybe going in the carrier, maybe eating treats in the carrier, maybe you put a meal on the carrier once in a while. The cat's going in and out, everything's going great. Then what we want to do is, one of the times the cat is in the carrier, we are going to close the door. Mm -hmm. We're just going to close it for a few seconds, open it again, end of story. And we're going to do that for a few times. Once that's going okay, we're going to close the door and go on a little trip, sort of. We're going to close the door, maybe walk around the apartment a little bit. If you live in a house, maybe go up and down the stairs, bring the carrier back where it was, open the door, let mm -hmm. the cat out. After that's going okay, we are now going to close the door, go out into the car, drive around the block, come back home, place the carrier where it was, open the door, treats, attention, love, let the cat back out and so forth. And we're gonna do all of these things intermittently. So sometimes the cat goes in and goes to sleep and the door doesn't close or we don't take a little trip around the house. And mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes we do. And by doing this very slowly, the cat will learn that nothing bad happens every single time she sees the carrier. And it's going to make life a lot easier to get your cat to the vet if 
So he looks at the carrier in a more neutral way than if the only time she sees the carrier is when she's going to go to the vet. So again, it's, it's a process of desensitizing the cat to the presence of that carrier. Um, I think the most important thing is just having it out. So the cat is always seeing the carrier and the cat is always smelling the carrier. But you do want to do these gradual sessions where you will close the door, you will bring the cat somewhere, but you're coming back and nothing's happened. Um, when things happen, if the only time the carrier is ever out and ever used is to go to the vet, mm -hmm. she's, she's never going to want to go in that carrier. But if sometimes nothing happens, it's kind of like it doesn't have those same negative associations. It's, it's intermittent, and that will make a big difference. You can also click or train your cats with the carrier too. Um, that takes a little longer and a little more patience, but I know a lot of people sort of enjoy doing the clicker training. So it's, you can click and treat when the cat goes in the carrier as well. Um, and that works, that works too. But any type of process you're doing where the carrier's present in a room, it's just there, will really go a long way um, in reducing that struggle because that first time that you have to really struggle to get that cat in <laughs> is extremely difficult. But if the cat, if you can throw a tree and the cat walks in on her own, yeah, that makes a big difference. Yeah, you don't want to be sweating during right before you go to the vet. You know, yeah. Or if there's an emergency. Again, if there's an emergency, if there's a fire or something, you got to get them in the carrier. You want to be able to make sure that is they feel safe in there. So and, and that's another good reason to always have the carrier out too. I mean, I know a lot of people have the carrier stored somewhere and they take it out for like that one, once a year or twice a year vet visit. Mm -hmm. But if, if there is an emergency, you need to go looking through your basement for the carrier, having the carrier in the living room is, is going to be a much easier way to get your cat out very quickly. I always say whenever you have a pet sitter, if you're away out of town traveling and you have a pet, pet sitter coming over to take care of your pets, make sure the carriers are out and visible and quick, quickly access, easily accessed by a pet sitters, because that to me is scary if there's a, if there's a problem and my pet sitter doesn't know where my cat carriers are. God yeah. forbid they have to be taken to the vet. So another scaredy cat situation, nail clippers, the terrible, terrible, terrifying nail clippers. <laughs> Help me out here. So this is this is going to be something that's a little more difficult if you've adopted an older cat. Mm -hmm. um, I only adopt older cats because I know they're harder to adopt. And I also only adopt, um, I adopt the cats nobody else wants. So yes. I, have a, I have a house full of behavior problems. So I, um, I have cats who turn into Cujo when it's time to clip their nails. And I use gabapentin on my cats okay, because it's just the least stressful thing for my particular cats. I have one who's been abused. She was hit. She's not going to let me, and she's eight years old. Okay. She's just not going to let me take her paws and clip her nails. Um, now, having said that, if you have a young cat, a kitten or any cat four or under, um, before they've gone through social maturity, you can definitely get that cat used to having her paws touched and used to having her nails clipped. And again, you don't want to go from zero to 60. So we're going to start off by just touching the paw. Gradually, we're going to, we can um, work our way, our fingers up into the paw pad and kind of spread out those nails. And so we want to do all kinds of touching and handling and holding before we just try to clip their nails. And <laughs> while we're doing this touching and holding and handling, we're going to treat. We're going to give a lot of attention. We're going to use our voice in a soothing tone all those things that we know are positive for a cat. So we're gonna start off by just holding their paw. Then we're gonna start rubbing their paw pads. Then we're gonna put our hands up into the paw pad in the way that mm -hmm. separates the nail so you could clip. Yeah. Um, and then before we actually clip, we're gonna hold the, hold the nails out, but we're just gonna make the sound of the clipper before we actually begin cutting their nails. And then when all of that is going okay and they're used to it, we can start by clipping, you know, maybe just one or two nails at a time. Stop, give the cat a treat, give the cat love, give the cat attention and work up from there.
But this is something that you want to start off with when your cats are young. Because if you don't get into that habit, when you don't get them used to having their paws touched, you sort of have that window of opportunity that you could lose. When you say make the sound of the clipper, um, I mean, do you just snap your finger so they get a sound or do you tap or should we have the clipper nearby so they can smell it and just let them smell it as you're touching their paws with one hand, hold the clipper near their nose or rub it against their cheeks so they can connect with this instrument and then, yeah. Yes, having the clipper there and I'll actually like squeeze the clipper so okay. they hear that noise okay. um, and treat. So, but don't, you know, you don't want to start off with that, but when you start getting into the paw pads and you're really putting your hands in there as if you were to cut their nails and mm -hmm. you're separating, um, getting the toes and the nails more visible, that's a good time to start introducing like the view of the clipper, using the clipper, they hear that little sound that it makes and letting them um, develop positive associations with that through giving the cat a treat. Um, something really yummy that, you know, mm -hmm. every cat has that really yummy treat they go wild for. Yeah. So reserve a super duper yummy treat for after those sessions. And then we can keep working up, working up. But again, it's something that you want to start off with doing at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. I would say if you have an older cat and the cat has never had somebody inexperienced um, cut her nails, or if you live alone, so you don't have someone who can put the cat in a kitty burrito while you do it, mm -hmm. you, I, I have no problem with looking into, you know, medication to take the edge off for your mm -hmm. cat. And, and I actually have had people use a little bit of medication and have been able to um, slowly wean the cat off from the medication. So that's a possibility as well. What about starting with just, just grooming with a, with a curry brush or a soft brush just and even rubbing that brush against their paws so they get acclimated. A lot of cats love their faces groomed or, or brushed. So doing that and getting into their oral area slowly and just going on their paws, would that help with the process? Yeah, brushing is great. You know, it's just getting used to all of that type of touch. And another um, great tool is a back scratcher. So Tell some people have some people, if they have a really real scaredy cat, the back scratcher, because it has a long handle, gives a little bit of a comfort zone from mm -hmm. um, between the cat and you. So that can be a really good starting point too, using a, a back scratcher. Because there are some cats that when they're touched in places they don't like, are gonna turn around and try to bite and swat. But yes. if you're using a back scratcher, you have that um, comfort zone and protection between the cat's teeth and your flesh. So, a, <laughs> a, so a, a scratching, um, a back scratcher can be a really great way to start off as well. And sometimes it's a good, if you're nervous, mm -hmm. a back scratch is a good starting place too, because if you're nervous about the process and you're emitting, you know, adrenaline and, and nervous um, um, pheromones, your cat will pick up on that. So a back scratcher can help you to feel like a, a good comfortable first step oh and you can always get the spray pheromones and put it on the back scratcher so might might even give you a sense of calm what <laughs> <laughs> yes whatever works you could whatever. definitely spray a back scratcher or a brush with the with the pheromone spray mm -hmm. um you can use catnip anything like that that a yep. cat might find enticing or comforting is perfectly fine yeah, and catnip comes in spray form as well. So we can use catnip spray if it, if we're trying to keep a distance between us and the kitty because Absolutely. for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah, right? no, yeah. There's all kinds of little tips and tricks of the trade that people can use. And, you know, you might have to use it forever, but you might be able to sort of wean away from it um, and as the cat gets used to you and trusts you. Yeah, great. Wonderful information. Anything else we sh should we know that... Is there anything else we should know about scaredy cats? I think the main things that I want to leave your listeners with um, is to go at the cat's pace, let the cat set the pace of the progress, and you'll be okay. Brilliant. Dr. Geller, thank you again for doing Cat University, and you're always a load of information. And I think 
you make life easy for cats. Thank you. Thank you.